Okay, we're going to kick things off now. So good evening or good afternoon or good morning to everyone, depending where you are in the world. Uh, right now for all of us on the panel, it's about 8.30 in the evening. So if we start to flag at any point, please be understanding. Um, it's great to have you all here today. So my name's uh, Ella Cobain, and I'm going to be moderating the first half of this panel, and then I will be passing over to Ross Duker for the second half. Um, in the first half, we're going to be talking about um, the book Demystifying Modern Slavery, which is a brilliant book written by professors uh, Dave Gadd and Rose Broad. Um, and then the second half, we'll be talking about a, another book, which I have to be honest, I haven't yet read, but looking at the title, I want to read it. And hopefully the moderator for that has read it and so we'll be able to do a better job, which is called Contesting County Lines, Case Studies in Drug Crime and Deviant Entrepreneurship. And that's by James Densley and Robert McLean. Um, so, yeah, what we'll do is we'll have about 25 minutes for each session and then we'll have a shared Q&A at the end. Um, none of you guys listening have access, I'm afraid, to microphones or cameras. Um, so can you please put your questions in the Q&A? It might be that um, authors are able to jump in and answer the odd bit directly in writing, uh, but most of those we'll just pick from some of those questions at the end. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of housekeeping. Um, today is um, European Union um, Anti-Trafficking Day, uh, which is quite coincidental given the topics of this panel and tends to be a day where there's a lot of um, there's a lot of bluster around very serious issues that do cause very serious harms, but often what you get is quite a simplified presentation of what are actually very messy, complex issues. So, in introducing Rose and Dave's book, um, Demystifying Modern Slavery. I think one of the things I really like about it as a book is it doesn't shy away from the tensions and the messiness and the difficultness of this space. So it encourages us to think that rather than these kind of idealised presentations of victims and offenders, that sort of assume that your abuse somehow, you know, doesn't matter unless you conform to this perfect victim stereotype or offenders are all these kind of evil bogeymen um, rather than, you know, doing awful things, but being messy, complicated humans like we all are. Um, it really tackles a lot of that face on. And I think that's particularly important at a time like now, where in the UK we're seeing a historical rollback on rights and protections afforded both to people who have been exploited to the threshold that is assessed as modern slavery, but also more generally in terms of the attack on asylum rights and so forth. And we're obviously living in difficult times, all the more so, right now um and we're increasingly seeing you know scapegoating and moral panics around issues relating to irregular migration to trafficking to exploitation um so i think times like these it's all the more important to look to really you know original important research such as theirs to see some of the things that you don't get behind the kind of simplified headlines and the idealized portrayals. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to them. Um, so over to you. Thank you, Ella, and thanks to everybody who's here tonight to listen. Um, it's actually a year this month since Rose and I sent our book to the publishers. And so it's a, a bit of a time to update on that. I guess we should start by saying that we're kind of sorry to say that the, the mystification that's referred to in, in the title of our book um, has intensified in the UK, the mystification that divides 
what the UK actually does about modern slavery and what it says it's doing has, has intensified. So over the last 10 uh, years or so, let me just get my slides moving. Uh, over, the last, over the last 10 years, the UK government policy on modern slavery appears to have gone uh, full circle. In 2013, the then Home Secretary Theresa May, subsequently Prime Minister, announced to the Conservative Party conference that she was going to tackle modern slavery, which she referred to as an evil in our midst, and she was going to empower the courts to prosecute and lock up slave drivers. By way of contrast, in 2022, Swella Braverman, uh, the current Home Secretary, addressed the Conservative Party conference by promising to confront the hard truth that our modern slavery laws are being abused by people smugglers and criminals peddling false promises. Convic convicted paedophiles and rapists, Braverman claimed, were gaming the system while small boats, migrants from Albania, were falsely claiming to be trafficked. They resort to the European Convention on Human Rights, exhausting the tolerance of the hardworking, patriotic majority of British people. So once depicted as, as helpless uh, women and children in need of rescue under the Theresa May agenda, modern slavery victims were suddenly recast as predatory foreign men in cahoots with organised criminal gangs, sometimes aided by lefty lawyers. Dave? Yeah? You've got the presenter view on. I don't know if you can change it or, or if it matters. Uh, I think I'll just stick with it, shall I? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> um, matter. You can see what's coming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can change it in time. The, the shift in... Um, conservative rhetoric prompted commentators from within the anti-slavery sector organisations that had once been kind of loyal to the Theresa May agenda uh, to challenge the government. So after exploitation, coordinated a formal complaint to the Office of Statistics Regulation on behalf of 23 NGOs, noting that Home Secretaries Braverman and Patel before her had deliberately deployed misleading statistics to secure sensationalist newspaper headlines. The former independent anti-slavery commissioner, Sarah Thornton, explained that the numbers that were rising in the NRM uh, were actually rising because the Home Office, the police and the immigration authorities had trained themselves to become better at victim identification. It wasn't that there were more false applicants in the system. Alicia McCaffrey, the chief executive of the Gangmasters uh, and Labour Abuse Authority, explained that the GLAA had not seen anyone gaming the system. Uh, modern slavery system for immigration purposes. Rather, she argued that government cuts to the GLAA's budget had rendered it impossible to investigate all but a tiny minority of reports of exploitation in the otherwise legitimate supply chains that provide goods to British shops and manufacturers. So, where have we got to? Uh, so, what few of the government's critics uh, were willing to explain publicly, however, is that some victims of modern slavery do break criminal and immigration laws as they attempt to navigate the near impossible choices displacement, destitution and desperation confront them with. So some victims do become offenders. Both national and international law on trafficking has long anticipated this uh, as a signatory to Article 26 of the 2005 Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings the UK is committed and remains uh, committed to what is conventionally called the non-punishment principle. This non-punishment principle makes it permissible uh, to not penalise victims of trafficking for their involvement in unlawful activities to the extent that they have been compelled to do so. Indeed, the, the UK remains legally obliged under Article 8 of the European Parliament's Directive 2011-36 to ensure that competent, authority, competent national authorities like the police or the Crown Prosecution Service are entitled not to prosecute victims of trafficking in human beings for their involvement in criminal activities. And while its terms remain uh, ill-defined, there are many exemptions, and there, and there are many exemptions to when its provisions apply, offences against the person, abandoning children, assisting unlawful immigration. Sexty, Section 45 of the 2015 Modern Slavery Act does provide a defence in UK law for adults who are compelled to commit a crime for reasons attributable to slavery or to relevant exploitation. Now, there are some quite set parameters around that clause 
in the modern slavery act you know the legal that to be to prove oneself innocent one has to demonstrate that a reasonable person in the same situation having the person's relevant characteristics would have had no real alternative to doing the act of committing a crime um, there is of course a lower standard for children under the same law children need not to need need not prove that they were compelled only that they offended as, as a direct consequence of being or having been a victim of slavery or other relevant exploitation so there's a question there about the difference between compulsion and doing something as a direct consequence of having been enslaved now what any of these terms mean compelled direct consequence reasonable person no realistic alternative uh, have been tussled over in the UK's Court of Appeal. And this has revealed just how difficult it is for defendants to prove at a trial that there is a nexus, the nexus being the, the, the legal term used, between their exploitation and their subsequent offending. In turn, UK prosecutors have, UK prosecutors have been reticent to apply the non-punishment principles. Within the lower courts, establishing what no realistic alternative looks like to a reasonable person with the same relevant characteristics as a victim of trafficking has proved tricky. And it's proved tricky, not least because most victims lack the resources to mount complex legal defences and are hindered by acute trauma in being able to recount harrowing experiences of abuse coherently. How reasonable can one be in the aftermath of extreme and prolonged economic and sexual exploitation? And how might one persuade a jury with little to no experience of what it's like to live in servitude or to fear deportation that you foresaw no other choice but to commit a crime. The Court of Appeals ru rulings reveal that UK courts tend only to validate the Section 45 defence when there is an immediate connection between being trafficked and committing an offence. Quite literally, you have to be starving and then you stole some food. Um, so it's that kind of immediate connection that the law is generous or forgiving towards. Such rulings typically come many years after victims of trafficking have been imprisoned for crimes that they have committed. Uh, at least until 2021, when the European Court of Human Rights established that the UK was in contravention of its commitments. Um, some defendants who had been given conclusive reasonable grounds decision by the NRM had until that point, but also had to demonstrate beyond a reasonable doubt to UK courts that they were victims of trafficking. Judges had been unwilling to accept that those deemed victims on an administrative balance of probabilities, the decision making of the NRM, were actually victims. Now, what these legal complexities mean for us as criminologists is that we actually need a much more fuller deconstruction of what lawyers call the nexus of compulsion. That is something that is really urgently needed as it applies to victims of modern slavery. And as we argued in our book, Demystify Modern Slavery, it also means accepting that victims and perpetrators of modern slavery very rarely fall into two neat indivisible groups. Some of the world's most desperate and destitute people do escape, escape exploitation by exploiting others. And they do this against a backcloth of acute injustices amplified by colonialism, global inequality and harsh border enforcement. It's in that context that many victims of modern slavery become offenders. So to get back to our book, I'll just say a bit about what we, we did before handing over to Rose. Um, between 2016 and 2021, we interviewed uh, 30 people, and uh, they were all people who'd been convicted of modern slavery and associated immigration or drug-related offences in the UK. Participants were invited to tell their life stories across two narrative focused interviews with vagaries of detail, contradictions and inconsistencies probed in the second interview. In around half, well, in half the sample, there were clear connections between experiences of victimization, modern slavery exploitation and subsequent engagement in criminal behavior. 15 of our participants met this criteria when strictly applied. But two thirds of the sample could have been included had we also incorporated those who'd experienced domestic or sexual abuse or neglect as children, or people who have been born uh, into uh, criminal families where there were kind of routine criminal enterprises. So we looked at these 15 cases uh, where there was this kind of potential nexus of exploitation, uh, where there was a connection between modern slavery victimization and exploitation and engagement in modern, in modern slavery offending. We found that these, these groups could be, this group could be further divided three ways. For the first group, which comprised just four people, 
were those who actually met the Section 5, 45 criteria. They were adult trafficking victims who had arguably been compelled to commit a crime or children who'd been trafficked who offended as a direct consequence of their exploitation. Then in the second group, of which there are eight people, uh, there were those who, um, those who did not meet the Section 45 criteria, but people who had been cajoled or manipulated into modern slavery offending following some other form of acute victimization and trauma. So as I say, there's eight of those. Then in the final group, there was uh, three people who have previously been subject to modern slavery in the past, um, but this exploitation, this modern slavery form of exploitation had ceased some time before they began exploiting others. Now that might sound a bit complicated, so I'm gonna hand over to Rose now and she will give an example of each of those types of exploitation nexuses. Thanks very much, Dave, and uh, thanks for having us in the conference and thanks to Ella for, for coming along in, like you say, at uh, what's nearly nine o'clock uh, in the night time on a, on a cold Wednesday. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about three people, one from each of those groups. Um, I think, like Ella said at the beginning, you can see that their stories of how they got into this are messy. And like Dave said, um, it's particularly you know, difficult to identify the binaries that that official narratives are very keen on on imposing onto these groups of people. So um, we can keep those things in mind while while we think about these three stories. Um, so the first person is uh, Vicky. Uh, all the names are, are pseudonyms, and she fits into the first category that Dave talked about. That she's a victim of exploitation who was arguably compelled to commit a crime. So she was a British national um, in her 20s when I interviewed her, who was serving a seven year sentence for conspiracy to supply heroin, um, which was part of a county lines um, operation. So perhaps links forward to uh, some of the things that are going to be talked about later. Um, her mother had died when Vicky was 10 and she became estranged at that point from her dad, who had been abusive to her mum. So she didn't want to live with him. She was consumed by grief and at 13 she was excluded from school after she set the toilets on fire and that was the last time she had any any formal education. At 16 she moved into a flat with her brother who was only 18 um, far away from family and friends um, and it turned out that, that they'd been set up in this flat by their uncle Steve who had offered them money where, which they, he said that they needed um, where he was running a, a drugs line and he then recruited his niece and nephew into the drugs line that carried on for eight years that Vicky said they'd been subjects of surveillance for eight years. Um, James, the brother, initially made um, two or three thousand pounds a week and eventually 30 grand a week selling the drugs locally. He offered Vicky a hundred pounds a day and she agreed to help him wrap small packets of heroin. When she turned 23, she was charged alongside James with conspiracy, conspiracy to supply alongside seven of James's friends, two of whom alleged that James and Vicky threatened to beat them up if they didn't continue drug dealing and one claiming he never got paid and he lost everything, his kids, his house as a consequence. In return, the friends were given very short sentences while James and Vicky took the, took the rap for their uncle who was never charged. So it was the uncle disappeared into the ether, presumably to, to continue uh, dealing. Um, the second person that falls into the second category is Alessandro. So he is a victim of non-exploitation offences who was cajoled into offending after his uh, victimisation. So Alessandro was an Albanian man in his late 40s who was serving a three year sentence for conspiracy to facilitate the illegal entry of 11 Albanian men and women into the UK, including pe bringing people in for slavery. At 18, Alessandro had been conscripted into the Albanian army um, before joining the Kos Kosovan Liberation Army. He there became an escort for Albanians who were attempting to flee the ethnic cleansing so when the war ended, Alessandro became a decorated war hero, but also received threats to his life. He fled on foot to an immigration detention centre in the UK, where he was welcomed as a refugee and helped with everything. 
He married and found a job as a labourer, but became depressed and suffered nightmares about his friends being killed in the war, alongside guilt of the people, the wives and children of the war dead left in poverty and starving back in Albania. These worries continued to escalate when his brother, who was still living in their home village, became ill. Alessandro turned to another Albanian man, Denard, who he knew from the building site where he worked for a loan in the hope of helping his brother to secure urgent medical care. Denard lent him £2,000, but then said that Alessandro needed to repay the money imminently in case his brother didn't survive. Knowing that Alessandro was off work, Denard asked Alessandro to do him a favour and collect a bag of clothes from the back of a lorry parked 50 miles away. Whilst denying that he knew there were Albanian migrants in the back of the lorry, Alessandro explained he was trying to help people, men with no work, to cross the border and make some money, just like other people had helped him when he was a young refugee. Arresting him at the scene, the police discovered a woman in the lorry who claimed to have been kidnapped. Though he was at risk of deportation and unable to see his now terminally ill wife, Alexandro expressed no ill will towards Denard, who continued to deny knowledge that migrants were stowed away on the lorry. Um, and the third person who fits into the third category is Grace, and she was a victim of modern slavery, where the victimisation had finished long a, a while before she began offending. So uh, Grace was a Kenyan woman in her 40s who was serving a custodial sentence of over 10 years for trafficking for sexual exploitation. She uh, grew up in Kenya and when she was 13, her mother had moved to a nearby town to escape her father, to escape Grace's father, who was an abusive alcoholic, leaving Grace to look after her sisters for five years. She did the cooking, the cleaning. She went to the farm to look for food. Um, and when Grace asked for help from her mum, she was beaten badly. Grace was beaten badly by her mum. At 22, she travelled to Ireland, where she was given the opportunity to look after a couple's children in return for, they said, uh, going to college and uh, accommodation in their house. She there became trapped in domestic servitude for about three months. The college education that she'd been promised uh, in exchange for looking after the children never appeared. She received no schooling and she was mistreated. She wasn't paid and she had her passport confiscated. Um, a friend of the family helped her escape by securing her work in a brothel as a receptionist answering the phone because she didn't want to, um, she didn't want to have sex with the men. She earned enough money to send home to her family, but she soon was cajoled into providing sexual services herself until a British man she'd met at the brothel invited her to open a new brothel with him. Aggrieved that she'd left the brothel, Grace's friend established, uh, uh, sorry, uh, they then told, the, the woman who'd helped her then told the Irish couple where she was. She was then worried that she'd be deported. And so she entered into a sham marriage with a man who was 20 years older than her, who bought her passport back from the Irish couple for about £5,000. She opened a hair and beauty salon as well as the brothel, but the brothel work proved very lucrative and she couldn't close it. She saved about half a million pounds distributed between five different bank accounts before she was arrested for tax evasion. She lost everything and was prosecuted for profiting from the sexual exploitation of others. So those three examples illustrate the three categories. And whilst the other uh, 12 people don't, you know, they're not exactly the same, they fit into, into those three categories. And the reason that we want to present these cases is to make an argument for a more empirically sophisticated account of modern slavery. One that doesn't pander to the victim idealization that Ella talked about at the beginning, and that has led to the kinds of racially motivated scapegoating that now defines the British approach to tackling modern slavery. The entrapment that can constitutes modern slavery typically arises because victims believe they have no recourse to law and that contacting the police will compound their plights in some way. This is evident in the cases of both Grace and Vicky, neither of whom mounted section 45 defences. Though Vicky's involvement in county lines began when she was a child, she was prosecuted as an adult 
And similarly, Grace's exploitation began when her parents abandoned her to raise her younger siblings in Kenya. Grace later escaped domestic servitude by working in a brothel, buying her passport back and entering a sham marriage and ultimately co-founding the brothel herself. Likewise, Alessandro's involvement in smuggling, although fleeting, could be traced back to his traumatization as a teenage soldier. The guilt he felt for those that he'd left behind after the war and its convergence with the debt he owed to a man who had lent him money for his brother's operation. Like Vicky and Grace, Alessandro wouldn't have been able to argue that he was compelled, legally speaking, to collect the passengers stowed away on the lorry. But it wasn't difficult to appreciate why he felt morally obligated to help his fellow Albanians he regarded as refugees, nor how this sense of obligation rendered him persuadable to returning a favour he owed to the man who had paid for the life-saving surgery that his brother had needed. Anticipating such contingencies in criminal law is perhaps impossible, but as criminologists, we need to become more vocal in public debate about how few victims of exploitation fit these stereotypes and binaries of dangerous foreign national offenders and helpless victims. We also need to ask whether it's in the public interest to subject those who have been abused and exploited to very long prison sentences that further estrange them from family members who remain dependent on them. Explaining the complex nexus of relationships spread across generations and continents that contribute to relationships of exploitation is essential to this task. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. And I think I am handing straight over to James and Rob and Ross, Robert, I mean, and Ross. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rose. Um, so, I think we're just moving swiftly on to our session now. So um, my name is Ross Duker and I'm Professor of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of the West of Scotland. And it's my pleasure this evening uh, to be chairing this next session uh, where we are going to be discussing this book here, um, which was released earlier this year by Bristol University Press, published by Bristol University Press, uh, Contesting County Lines, Case Studies in Drug Crime and Deviant Entrepreneurship, written by James Densley, Robert McLean and Calton Brick. So I'm delighted uh, this evening to be able to welcome um, two of the lead authors here uh, tonight, um, Dr. James Densley, who is Professor and Department Chair of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Metro State University uh, in Minnesota, USA. But James is originally from England and earned his DPhil in Sociology from the University of Oxford. So James is a very, very good colleague and good friend of mine, and uh, he is the author or editor of 11 books, including the one we're talking about tonight, uh, Contesting County Lines, and has also published over 50 peer-reviewed articles in top scientific journals, as well as more than 100 other works in various outlets, including The Guardian, the New York Times, Times Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. So um, suffice to say, James is prolific in the field. And I had the uh, pleasure of first meeting him a number of years ago when we were speaking at a, a conference together in Hong Kong. And since then have had the great opportunity to, to work and publish with him a, a, a number of times. And also welcoming uh, Robert McLean, um, who again, very good colleague and good friend of mine and works actually in the same school and same department uh, as myself. So Robert is a lecturer in criminology and criminal justice at the University of the West of Scotland. Robert again is prolific in his field. Uh, he has published numerous articles and a number of books uh, in the area of gangs, street gangs, 
uh, and also County Lines Drug Dealing. And uh, again, has published um, many, many articles in peer-reviewed journals and uh, appeared on various media outlets as well, talking about his work in this field. So um, this book here that James and Robert have collaborated on is a fascinating publication because it is somewhat unique uh, in the way that it has been written and the way in which the authors have drawn upon their rich ethnographic data in a very unique way um, where they have told the real life stories of drug dealers who are involved in county lines networks, including their methods, motives and misfortunes. So the book is aimed at students, scholars, practitioners and policy makers and busts a number of myths uh, in terms of the way we think about county lines in relation to gangs and serious organised crime. And it's very applied and very accessible in the way that it is written and provides some uh, new ideas for drug crime prevention, intervention and enforcement. Uh, so the book has already been uh, very, very uh, widely read and reviewed. And interestingly, a couple of the reviews stand out. Um, Anthony Goodman from Middlesex University has described the book um, as, you know, raw, violent, challenging and totally engrossing ethnographic research at its best. Mohammed Rahman from Birmingham City University has talked about um, the book being an academic page turner and having uh, read the book myself, I can certainly contest to that. It's rare in as much as it not only provides rich and scholarly insights from ethnographic data, but is also highly accessible, compelling, and a uh, very, very dramatic um, in terms of the way it weaves together these case studies of real life stories of drug abusers, uh, drug dealers. So I don't want to give too much more away about the book because the next 25 minutes is going to give us the opportunity for the authors to talk about the content of the book themselves. And so the format that we're going to take is that I'm going to just, you know, have uh, the opportunity to ask James and Robert a number of questions about the book uh, and, and its content. And then we'll pass over to you as the audience to um, open it up to wider Q&A uh, from the floor. So um, could I start off then by asking, uh, if we could maybe turn to you, James, first of all, as lead author, um, can you just tell us a little bit more about what this book is all about? Yeah, thanks, Ross. Thanks for doing this uh, today. And thanks for that very kind introduction uh, to us and to the book. It's always a pleasure to be uh, to be working with you, and I greatly appreciate it. So. Yeah, this was an interesting project to work on um, in so much that we had already done some research in the past on county lines. We, uh, Robert, myself, and also working with Grace Robinson, um, had authored a kind of introductory book to county lines, which was sort of setting a benchmark for some of the preliminary knowledge about the phenomena. And then there's been some other books that have followed since uh, Simon Harding, uh, who I actually think is, is uh, uh, an audience member right now, uh, has obviously written in this area and there's others as well. But there was one thing that throughout all that process of the work that was going on in County Lines that I think we couldn't help but notice, which was that the County Lines phenomena was essentially becoming its own self-fulfilling prophecy, which it was to say that there was kind of a standard narrative about what county lines was. And if it didn't fully conform to what the government authorities told you that it was, then it couldn't be county lines. And I think what this ended up becoming was a way of seeing sort of a, a reification of this phenomena that 
wasn't necessarily actually capturing all aspects of it. And in some ways was actually becoming more narrowing for that reason. So I just switched the slide here. For those of you in the audience that are sort of uh, international or maybe not so familiar with the concept of county lines, the county lines phenomena is defined uh, in sort of British policy and practice as being the um, movement of uh, illicit drug supply from hub cities. So we're talking about large metropolitan areas like London, for instance, or Glasgow in the state, in the case of our book, which is based mostly in Scotland, to more remote rural areas. But the narrative is that this uh, movement of drugs is facilitated almost exclusively by gangs, that the participants tend to be young and exploited individuals who have no agency in this process in the way that it's described, um, which is, I think, why we're in this panel, actually, at the moment when we're talking about modern slavery, because modern slavery has become the lens through which we, we look at county lines. And that this entire operation only really exists because of the advent of smartphones and social media, which facilitate the, um, the county line drug dealing process. And since county lines, which the, the, the terminology is kind of an odd thing for an international audience, you're probably thinking, why is this called county lines? That just sounds like drug dealing. But the reason it's called this is because the drugs are moving through the, the boundary lines of police force areas. These are the different counties um, in, and jurisdictions in the United Kingdom. So that's where this sort of terminology comes from. And since it was first discovered, so to speak, um, it has since been discovered everywhere. And now it's a sort of universal phenomena that exists in, in, in throughout the country. So very quickly, I'll say what the book is about. The book is essentially interrogating that definition to say whether or not this way of seeing is entirely accurate. And I think where we challenge it is on sort of five or six different areas. So number one, we find through our research that people are migrating from these hub cities to the county sites, not just at the direction of gang leaders, but actually for personal and family reasons. And why this is interesting is because it's a very similar narrative to what was discovered in the United States in the 1990s, research around gang migration, to suggest that a lot of this stuff is not quite as intentional as people think it is. So it's not that the gang gets together and decides, aha, we're going to exploit this town. It's more a case of like, well, James has you know, a, a friend in this place, and so maybe we'll go to that place because there's already an existing co uh, community and network there. The second thing is that it's the people with the existing ties to those cities uh, and to those uh, county sites who are the ones who are responsible for the logistics on the ground. I think there's a perception that these gangs just kind of move into these areas and take them over, but that's not necessarily the case. And the ones that do that are adults, not children, because children are too de developmentally young and conspicuous to be truly operating these county lines, which is, again, a bit of a, a, a difference from the standard narrative around this. I think the other finding that was interesting is that these drug dealers don't actually always enthusiastically embrace the kind of always on culture of drug dealing in the era of smartphones and social media. In fact, in some cases, they actually find the digital dealing if you will, to be a bit of a chore and actually a bit of a liability. And that in some cases, the drugs comes first and the social media and, and everything else comes second. And I think that's uh, a flip of the way in which this has been portrayed almost exclusively as a digital phenomena. Um, and then there were some other things around exploitation, which really get into questions around agency. And I think... I'll leave it there for now and move into the next question for Robert when we talk a little bit more about um, you know, who the case study is about. But what we actually see is a lot of agency, particularly among some of the youth that are involved in this, 
but also the women who are involved in county lines, who I think in the standard narrative have just been portrayed as sort of idealized victims. Um, and I think the reality of county lines is it's much more complicated. And it's about embracing that complexity to really get to the heart of the problem to do something about it. Yeah, that's great, James. Right, we need some fascinating insights already to to whet our appetite. So, so to build on that, then could we turn to you, Robert, and could you tell us a little bit about the two main case studies in the book? Yeah, hi everybody. Yeah, I'd like to say hi to Simon if he's still in the audience as well, because obviously we've written together and they helped me through my PhD. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so basically the point, as James was saying, of the book, it's not that we actually intentionally set out to, you know, write this book. All that happened is we had had different research, uh, you know, for a number of uh, different studies, research had formed that allowed us to see a kind of overarching picture of how drug distribution worked in Scotland, really, and also, I suppose, Northern England. And what it was is we had really, uh, as James is saying, wanted to shed light on, light on the realities of drug supply. And lots of the narratives that fit county lines, you know, we had seen this start to be a model that was being applied, you know, kind of across the board in some cases. And we just wanted to shed light on the reality of drug dealing because lots of the narratives and lots of the suggestions as to how drug distribution operates, even across counties, didn't really add up, you know. So we just wanted to really shed the light on that. So what we did is we looked at uh, basic research I'd carried out over a really a 10 year period, I suppose, uh, through several studies. And we had myself and James had written a book just before this called uh, Scotland's Gang Members. Uh, <clears throat> and what it was really was a case study uh, upon a particular group that we see moving through being like just a delinquent street group, you know, a, a youths. And then as they, you know, start to get houses in the picture has came up here on the slides. This is actually, you know, one of the buildings uh, or one of the uh, same type of building as the this gang tended to operate in. And what they did is they moved for just recreational street violence into drug distribution uh, uh, and then eventually into organised crime, such as laundering money, having various uh, division of labour and so on. So what we wanted to do when we had the data is we decided to look at uh, really this, this gang in particular. And, you know, what had happened is the gang as they had grown and developed, several members obviously relocated to various areas for different reasons. And one of the members would be called Greece in the book, relocates to quite a rural a rural area of Scotland. And when they relocates, uh, somebody in the group suggests, you know, maybe we should actually use this person to distribute drugs, simply because he's moving and it provides them with some income, allows them to make connections uh, further afield and so on. And this was really taken up by the group. Uh, and the, you'll see, uh, we've brought up a wee table here. So there's photos down the side, and this is the type of areas uh, that drugs were being distributed in. So a wee bit different for Glasgow, where it's like the high-rise flats and tenement buildings, and it becomes kind of, kind of more rural landscape uh, and cottage-type houses and so on. So we compared this case uh, with Greece moving uh, to one of these rural areas towards another group who were a bit more sophisticated and had been about for a bit longer. And what had happened is with the second group is they had also moved to a rural area uh, and, yeah, they the set up a drug distribution network. So we've got the two county lines, really. That's, you know, we looked at the different definitions and that's how we defined them as county lines. So we have county lines one, uh, and this is overseen by, you know, the people in the previous book that we call the street boys. Uh, with Bob and Billy is really the drug traffickers, if we're going to, you know, define them into these roles. I say some of the rules are down here, but they're not as set as you know we we give uh, listings for here. And we see in County Lines too, you have Amy, who really what is is Amy was you know, went out with a high level uh, drug dealer in in Glasgow who had lots of connections to the criminal underworld. And then Amy relocated uh, following violence, uh, domestic violence, and she relocates. And because she's always kind of dealt drugs, this then became the narrative to deal drugs where she went elsewhere. And what happens is with Amy, we see uh, our brother Echo and Paul, you know, two uh, brothers who then follow her 
to to the new area that she moves into, and to really just c- continue where they left off in Glasgow, and then start to you know move drugs from Glasgow into these areas, and through that, uh, you know, Echo has quite a outgoing personality and outgoing nature, and it makes a lot of connections in these small rural villages with people that maybe have uh, substance addictions and so on, and starts to use them to store drugs and distribute drugs, and then you know just sets up sets up really just through a telephone line. Uh, and we have Peter and Susanna at the bottom, who are really two individuals you really capture this, and they're basically, you know, long-term drug addicts. And really through coercion and a wee bit of forcefulness, Echo gets them to store drugs and begin to, you know, sell drugs. And when they try to leave that life, they get friendly with violence and so forth. In the other case, in County Lines 1, we have Bob and says Bob and Billy moving to drugs, trafficking drugs for Glasgow, uh, to Greece, who's... Like it says, moved to a rural location in Greece in terms of exploitation. He's not really, you know, the sharpest uh, tool in the box. And what Greece kind of does is he recruit, recruits local dealers, uh, just by offering them, you know, drugs at a cheaper rate and so on. Brings young boys into the fold. He also brings a young boy, interestingly, actually brings a young boy, Robert, up uh, from Glasgow or a suburb just outside Glasgow. Uh, to where he stays, you know, under the pretense of giving him so much money and so on. And Robert gets tied into this uh, into this network and he gets tied into it because when he's there, and this is quite an important part of what he to demonstrate in the book, is he actually meets a girl, Stacey, who, you know, Greece uses to store drugs. And it's that relationship between Robert and Stacey and the form and the, the bond that keeps them together and keeps Robert locked in uh, to this kind of a situation that becomes very, very volatile. And that's, like I said, the two kind of organisational structures there, like I said, and just a wee bit on the background on the two case studies. But as James was saying, the real point of it was to demonstrate the realities of drug supply and also to bring, you know, remember that people aren't just drug dealers or, you know, exploited individuals. There's a lot, they have lots of different roles, you know, they play lots of different uh and they play lots of different roles in society to, you know, their kinship, friendship and so on. And it's really the relationships, which is really the point of the book, to bring this out and how people become tied into these networks. Um, yeah, so that's really just a bit about the two case studies. And I'll just move back over to yourself, James. Yeah, oh, Ross, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're muted, Ross. Ross, you're you're muted. You would think I would have learned by now. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, we are coming back to you, James. Uh, what I would like to do now is thanks, Robert, for giving us that really good insight into the the case studies. Um, can you now talk a little bit, James, about that unique approach um, that I mentioned in the um, in the intro uh, that has been picked up on by the reviewers as well, you know, um, in terms of the way you apply the narrative style uh, to the book. Can you describe this a little bit more for the listeners tonight? Yeah, uh, this is great to actually talk about because, um, and actually I think I could stop sharing now um, for the, with the slides and I can just talk about this because, um, the book is written uh, unlike a typical academic book, I think is the best way to describe it. Um, and that was very in- intentional for a couple of reasons. One, it is an ethnographic study. So as Robert mentioned, Robert has been embedded in this uh, field, in this network for the best part of a decade. And there are times when you're doing that type of work over the course of a decade where, you know, you just have so much data and so much exposure and 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 interaction with the research participants that trying to then structure it in your traditional academic style of you know uh, here's my literature review and then here's my quote to back up whatever theoretical point i'm trying to make just didn't feel authentic it didn't feel um like it did justice to what the data was telling us. So we we talked about why don't we just kind of throw the rule book out, you know, out the window and do and write the book that we want to write. Um, and we'll see if someone will publish it. 
was and luckily Bristol agreed. Um, but there was a while there where we thought, you know, who knows uh, what people are going to think about this. Um, so, yeah, it's written in what you might call a sort of narrative nonfiction style. So it's almost written more like a novel than it's written than an academic book. Now, of course, we try to weave in the literature and the theory and everything else because it is an academic book at the end of the day and it has an academic um, you know, point to make. But we try to write it in a way where you're bringing the reader into the lived experience of the research participants. So it's written in a style like you are there with them in the room and you're kind of experiencing all the things that they're experiencing at that same time. And that was a, an interesting way to construct the work because you're basically deconstructing lengthy interview transcripts to then have a little bit of kind of artistic license in a way to tell the story in the way it was lived in that moment. And of course that raises, you know, sort of some ethical and other uh, dilemmas about how you present these narratives. But I think we're very transparent in the front of the book to say, this is a narrative criminological style. And it's recognizing that there is objective reality, but really everything is about perception. It's about how you perceive your reality. And so we are telling this story from the perspective of the participants, and this is their truth. Um, again, that's different from the truth, but this is their truth, if that makes sense. So I'll give you an example of like how, how the book's written, and it's, and it's all written sort of like this, but I'll, I'll take an, an excerpt very, very briefly to show you. So um, this is a scene late in the book where the character Robert uh, that's a pseudonym, but this is a real person, um, is um, is attacked um, in, 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 a, in a public park. And so it reads uh, as, as follows. Suddenly, Robert saw a flash of white in his peripheral vision, followed by a blunt pain across his eye. Jimmy had punched him. While taller and older than Robert, Jimmy's punch was surprisingly weak. Robert retaliated, grabbed hold of Jimmy's tracksuit top, and a brief scuttle ensued until Robert felt a sharp pain running up his cheek from the top of his lip to his right ear, followed by a dizzying warm sensation. Stacy screamed. That was the moment that Robert's stock bubble burst. His status gains were lost. No one wanted to be in his shoes now. He's fucking slashed you, one of the local youths in the crowd who was watching the fight shouted. Oh, mate. Another one chimed in, ashen-faced. Robert immediately let go and backed up. He put his hand to his face and felt the warmth of the blood spilling down his arm. What the fuck have you done? Robert asked in disbelief. However, Jimmy just kept coming. He lifted the knife up over his head and brought it back down on Robert. Robert raised his arm to block it, but he felt the knife rip through his sleeve and cut through his arm. He turned away and ran. And so the book, in every chapter, in every interaction, every drug deal, every cuckooing incident, every, um, every fight is sort of written in this style of trying to put the reader in the room as it's happening or in the scenario as it's happening to try and really show the reality of what it is to live this type of a life. And that's the, and that's the style of the book. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and I mean, I've, I've always believed that ethnographic researchers are at heart storytellers in, in many ways, you know, and it's that dramatic recall. And I think you guys have just gone that stage further um, and really taken this into a narrative style, which is really compelling. Um, so clearly, I mean, just from that one scenario and lots of other examples in the book, uh, we can see that conducting this ki kind of research brings with it lots of ethical issues and risks. Um, can you talk us through some of these, uh, some of the issues you've maybe had to grapple with, Robert, being the one that was out in the field collecting the data, and how you were able to address some of these? 
Yeah, like it says, um, just to touch on what James <coughs> had says when he was reading that out, we'd had, you know, we had thought it was very important because when we'd written Scottish gang members previously, there was such good data, you know, that people were telling their stories, but we hadn't written it in the same manner. So somebody, if they'd been stabbed or shot or whatever, simply says, I've been stabbed or shot and then told us the backstory to it. And then when we're telling that story, it's kind of lost to the reader. It just becomes words. So we were, like I said, we were really wanting to kind of put them there. Uh, but in terms of the ethical issues, yeah, <laughs> there's, of course, lots of ethical issues. And, you know, that's yourself, Ross, even when I did my PhD um, under yourself because you were my supervisor. We had kind of wanted to do ethnographic research on this topic uh, and try to get the approval to do, you know, ethnographic research in its purest form was very difficult to do. So it would, you know, it comes down to doing interviews and, like I said, try to reach out to, you know, to that kind of hidden or hard to reach population. So, you know, we just followed the standard processes going through. Uh, the different charities and organisations, third sector uh, organisations and so on to get in contact them. You know, we still have contact with many of them, Ross, really thanks to yourself in that. But really we had felt, I mean, I remember Cell and you discussing that we had missed, we felt we were missing, you know, lots of times like youths may attend the youth centres, but the real hard to reach populations that we really wanted to contact that were really embedded in these criminal networks often kind of look inwards in each other so they don't really always you know get in touch with these different organizations and um, we spoke about you know using that uh, snowball sample uh, just for people with a wee bit of background information that like says uh, i suppose i come from uh, a similar type of background you know having grown up uh, in these types of networks and so on so that says if my i always say to people if my dad or my uncle were policemen i would have interviewed policemen but they weren't you know, so I didn't interview policemen, I interviewed other individuals and so on. And applying that snowball sample and having the backing of certain individuals, you know, to vouch for you, to open up their stories without fear of being prosecuted. Uh, or, you know, because lots of times you'll interview people and they'll think, oh, is this a police officer? Why is he asking these questions? Can I truly trust them? Can I tell them this? Can I tell them that? You know, regardless of whether they've been charged for convictions or not. You know, so lots of them tended to kind of hold back a wee bit but uh, yeah going out and just going that extra mile you know what it says engaging in you know myself and you both engaging in weightlifting uh, at these kind of you know spitting sawdust gyms you know engaging with people that way spending time with them going out playing football with them you know I remember uh, doing my PhD actually joined you know I've always played football but I had to actually join and commit to a five-a-side football team and another, another 11 a side football team simply to get some of these guys to talk to us because they're just normal people who enjoy also sports like the rest is. And some of the ethical issues when you speak about this is what it says, you're getting the interviews and then for this style of book, we just really wanted to change the narrative in terms of how we wrote it to, you know, put people in the scene and really allow them to live, you know, what the person who we're interviewing is living. But of course, there's always the issues such as, you know, what can be told and that's something that uh, we always think that you know really what can be told is something that you're always grappling with because you think it's sometimes it just takes away some of the you know the strength of the data but of course uh, in terms of with this data you know when we're doing the interviews I was going back to networks connecting with people, speaking to them, speaking to them a lot outside also the actual interviews itself. Uh, and yeah, that's really how it was done. I think it's just really having, as you're saying, been involved in the field for so long, been involved in the field for like a decade or more, uh, is really, you know, what is where that data lies and being able to access that data and bring it forth. Uh, I'm happy to take any other questions on the FA questions, but I'll hand it back over to yourself, Ross. You're on mute again. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, that's great. Thanks, Robert. That was a really, really helpful insight. So um, conscious that time is a little bit against us. So um, what I'd like to do at this point is to open up uh, the discussion to Q&A. So just handing over to the audience and taking any questions that might come from the floor. So we can't do direct questions. Um, right. We need people to put them in the Q&A box. That's so cool. 
if we can encourage people to keep submitting in there um and i've got one to kick us off with if that's all right yeah. um which is i'm actually interested to hear both both sets of speakers on this um but I'd probably go to rose and dave first which is around the exploitation frame and its utility in the context of when young people in particular are being criminally exploited because we have a situation where there is this legislation in place that states that you know if you are under 18 and you are essentially involved in criminal activity there doesn't actually need to be force or fraud or coercion or deception for it to be considered trafficking and that creates quite a difficult situation because there are these blurry boundaries right around what then would be criminal exploitation versus what would be criminal activity and sort of coming through from both your presentations with quite different angles on that I should say as well I'm I spent a long time yesterday talking to a friend and colleague who works directly with a lot of families whose children are being exploited in county lines and the sheer sense of frustration coming through at these young people being criminalized for things they were being pushed into doing often with quite extreme levels of coercion um I guess, you know, what's going wrong? What's going right? What what do you guys see working better? Because it feels like what's happening right now is not really working. Thanks, Ella. Um, I think it's fairly difficult for Dave yeah, and I so because we awesome. only interviewed adults. However, obviously, Vicky and grace were both exploited although grace for domestic servitude but vicky was criminally exploited as a child um from what i think from i think it i mean it became she became one of these people that practitioners would say she wouldn't engage um and you hear that word a lot don't you about engagement and the onus is very much the responsibility is very much on the victim to engage rather than for practitioners to find ways around and that yeah that might be unfair and it might not always be the case but I think she was you know very difficult she's excluded from school she then doesn't turn up to anything she lives with her brother and she's victimized but it isn't picked up because she's very difficult um so yeah through a failure to pick up her childhood victimization she then ends up criminalized and serving a seven-year sentence where had that been picked up she would be safeguarded and I think potentially the I mean I know there's yeah potentially the the, the county lines framework or and has the potential for safeguarding but I wonder how often that's happening really and yeah how how difficult that is um yeah Dave, Dave um, did you want to, you oh Dave yeah go ahead um yeah I I kind of agree with the gist of your question of course we did interview a lot of people whose exploitation began as as children who who became offenders too as, as children I think the whole modern slavery agenda is, is really distracted from what kind of needs to be done. That's kind of tackling low pay, tackling gross inequalities across the world, tackling the kind of harm that, that harsh border enforcement does, the hostile environment does, um, you know, providing rights for children, for, for sex workers, uh, for migrant workers. I think we as criminologists have kind of taken our eye off the ball a bit with both both of these agendas that have been construed in really kind of criminalizing kind of ways and I think that's a, that's a real problem uh, an increasing an increasing problem under the under the government we've got now who can sort of say we're doing more stuff to tackle 
x y or z problem we're doing more to to stop the boats but actually we're doing nothing to tackle any of those underlying problems which you know would recognize that exploitation operates as a bit of a machine or as an ecology you know that there are, mm. there are damp dynamics going on here it's not just one person or the other so that's my view i, I, th I think we i think we need to start to reframe these debates in a different way now thank you james yeah, the only thing I'd add on this, because I, 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 I agree uh, what's been said, is in the area of the county lines and particularly looking at youth, I think the framework that we use in the book, particularly in the last chapter, which then tries to really put the sort of theory and the research back in uh, to, to make the conclusions, is around sort of a concept creep and a pathologizing of behaviors that... Um, that there's this sort of narrative of vulnerability that everything needs to be fit within this narrative in order for it to sort of check the right boxes for the government response. And I think there's a problem when, when a concept like uh, modern slavery or exploitation or criminal child exploitation or county lines, for instance, they get to a point where they become so all encompassing mm. that they mean everything, but they also mean nothing. And so and then that becomes a real barrier because you've got practitioners who are saying well does this fit in the right box and they feel sort of hamstrung in what their responses are because of that and so there's a risk at times that we we use language to explain a phenomena because we think it's going to help but actually it might actually be hindering the the, the response from a policy or practice standpoint and i think that's something that's that's a challenge in, in this area. Um, and I think going back to what David just said, um, a lot of this seems rooted in inequality, um, challenges in education systems, lack of opportunity, um, this sort of situated choice that people have. Um, so where there is agency involved, you know, they uh, are still not necessarily making truly rational decisions in there in the uh, the ways in which people people are, are making those decisions and so i just think it's sort of a, a a recognition of the complexity of human decision making um and 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 some of that sometimes gets lost i think in the in the the policy framework and the way in which it happens mm -hmm. robert did you want to add anything or should we go to the other questions. No, I'm happy to go to the other question because I know there's a few I've been trying to type them in. <laughs> okay. Ross, do you want to choose one or do you want me to? Sorry, Ella, where, where do we actually find oh, Okay, it? don't worry. It's at the bottom where it says Q&A. Oh. Um, you see that? Or shall I ask another one while you're finding it? We've yeah, got some can ask another one. Um, right, we've got one from Simon Harding, which is Rose and Dave. I find that NRM fails to ident fails so many people in the UK, and many first responders don't identify or act upon it. Should the UK government separate UK county lines exploitation from overseas or international exploitation? Uh, definitely, yes. For me, I, I, I've asked this question in a few contexts, and I cannot see what UK nationals get out of being referred into the NRM. It doesn't seem to me that foreign nationals get a great deal out of it either, apart from what is now, what, nearly two years having to prove that they are victims of trafficking for a temporary leave to remain. But I, I can't for the life of me work out what it is that UK nationals who are involved in, in county lines drug dealing get out of being in that system. They're entitled to protection as victims anyway. So I, I think something is, is being very much obscured in NRM data and NRM processes by, by pushing the two together. Um, and then there's one from Alan Dawes. Um, no particular name on this one, so please do just jump in, anyone who feels well-placed for it. In these investigations by police agencies, you know, local police agencies, county police agencies or others, 
are other professionals involved in the questioning of a vulnerable person or is it only a detective or several so other people in the sense of social workers psychologists etc uh, i think a lot of it is is contingent on on the referral process by which people are, are becoming uh, i guess uh, uh, the, the law enforcement becomes aware of of the situation but when it comes down to the question, then it's basically in the purview of the of the police, and that's what's being operated. Now, subsequently, if you get referred to the right services after you've been identified as being uh, a victim or at risk and so on, then there could well be follow-up with a psychologist and a social worker and everything else. But the initial assessments um, are really being undertaken much more through that sort of lens. But that being said, um, I do think there's an increasing recognition that the law enforcement are not just treating people as uh, criminals and criminalizing. I think there is m this this recognition that people can be understood as being victims and being exploited. And so there is a sort of different lens through which they're in conducting these investigations and interrogations and so on um, to to fit with that approach um i think you know we talk a lot about multi-agency working and safeguarding and wraparound services and things like that but i don't know in all jurisdictions nationwide how that really operationalizes i think maybe it looks different in london or glasgow than it does in you know rural areas where actually this is where the issue lies so that's a challenge it's so fragmented and it depends where your interactions are because, you know, if you're dealing with a specialist officer, yeah, sure, they might well be very well aware of this stuff and take it into account. If you're dealing with, you know, your local your safer neighbourhoods team or something, exactly. then um, I think there is a huge overestimation of how much things have moved on. And I mean... The, the experiences you hear from people are, are terrifying still. So I think it's also important to remember Scotland's slightly different in that we have mm. the children's hearing system, you know, so we have that kind of stage uh, just before adulthood where children can be kind of caught in between the nexus of being victims and offenders. So, you know, we do have that in Scotland, which has proven at times to be very successful. In terms of dealing with, you know, some of these issues, though, uh, it's maybe not always quite at that level, though. You know, it really deals with probably people that are better, uh, more kind of minor uh, type of offending. And I think we're out of time. Yeah. I think so, yeah. And I think we've covered most of the questions. Well, thanks for coming.